Thank you for that, Birgitta. So, speakers, what do you think about today's topics? Can I say, first of all, thank you, everybody. Yeah, it's been very interesting. And I loved every presentation. Yes, I'm sorry I forgot to mention you, Giorgio, because uh, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation too. But you were the first one, so you didn't have to. <laughs> no, but it was it was really a good beginning. So it was uh, so set the tone. <laughs> hmm. uh, maybe Svandis, do you, uh, what do you think? Do you have uh, any questions for us? Well, I've already received some questions. Oh, okay. From online, so. All right. Would you like to get one? Uh, it's for Giorgio. Mm -hmm. Could you help us to translate works of John McCurty into Ukrainian? We need your help in order to deal with rights on translations and publications. Uh, well, I studied a little Russian when I was young, but I mm -hmm. don't think it would be an uh, idea for me to uh, help with the actual uh, translation about the apps and uh, explaining some key concepts. But yes, of course, I'd be available. Uh, the, I have assisted with the translations uh, into Spanish and uh, Italian of uh, the cancer stage of capitalism. So uh, I could certainly help out vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the Ukrainian translation. I don't think that there should be any big uh, issue as regards uh, uh, any uh, rights. Uh, McMartin himself, as the author of uh, the book, retains them, and so his material can be freely translated into foreign languages. Right, and there is uh, somebody here wanting to get Vala Ragnarsdottir slides for her talk. Is that possible? Yeah, my slides are always available. So I can give them to Cliff and he can upload them or send them or whatever is best to do. Great. And, and we have a question here for everyone, I think. How do we move towards a circular economy model if the rules are only made for the free market model? Uh, it's not enough just to take the you know, take some stuff and recycle it um, and then continue as before. It will reduce a little bit what we need from the mountains in terms of resources. But we, we need to link the, the uh, circular economy with other economic models, um, like the, uh, the one that I mentioned there, the, 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 the bio, the biophysical, the biophysical uh, circular economy for well-being. That's, that's an effort to integrate the well-being uh, of nature and people into the circular model. I could add uh, one thing uh, because I was listening uh, uh, with keen interest to uh, Birgitta who was describing her own experience as a parliamentarian. And uh, when we talk of uh, civil commons, parliaments, uh, as well as universities, such as those in which uh, Vala and I work, uh, can function as civil commons uh, insofar as they serve the public good. They don't always do it, of course, but they can, and uh, often they've done it. And uh, these are just two of the many tools that we have at our disposal. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, as I said, there are trade unions, there are um, uh, NGOs, there are consumer associations. Uh, there is a, a whole network of uh, uh, legal bodies and uh, uh, legal instruments that uh, can and must be utilized and have already been utilized because uh, under certain respects we have made some progress but not enough because as Vala uh, clearly uh, depicted uh, for us uh, the current economic trends uh, are life destructive on the grandest scale imaginable. 
But uh, yeah, we don't have to do anything particularly innovative. We have to use the tools that are at our disposal and push them all into one direction. Can, can I uh, say something to this? Uh, I've actually been studying how the neoliberal economic model was sort of instigated. Um, and it, it originated in a, in a meeting in, in a village called Man Pellerin in Switzerland in 1947, where 36 men came together. They were economists, histori historians, and philosophers. And they came up with this uh, uh, market, market economy model. And then after that, um, the, the uh, American Chamber of Commerce um, commissioned a report from a guy called uh, Powell, the Powell Memorandum for the Chamber of Commerce of the United States in 1972, where he basically laid out how they were going to achieve this model. They were going to take over the economics department and, and support um, professors being hired in who were uh, had a neoliberal inkling. They were going to write all the textbooks that should be used in all economics and business schools um, in the United States and elsewhere. And they are still being taught. I go and check every once in a while in my bookstore here at the University of Iceland. <laughs> still the primary text. And, and this is what we, so here's where we need to be more clever. Um, this is why I, I, I named this project 36 times 36 uh, in training young women and, and new economic thinking. <laughs> because what, what we aim to do is to train 36 and then they go back to their communities and we will have uh, people from all over the world and they will replicate the training they got from us in Argentina, in Spain, in China, in India, and, and in Africa, and in Europe, and so on. 36 times 36 is 1,296. And then, it's, you know, it will be replicated some more. Then we need to sit down and write the textbooks, and we need to make sure that they're actually taught in the different universities. And we can use social media, and, and, but we need to be more clever than the neoliberals, you know, and they also took over being advisors to presidents like Reagan, like Margaret Thatcher, like uh, um, Angela Merkel, and China even bought this philosophy. So, but now we need the new philosophy because if we don't, then we're screwed. That's it. So, and and there is a big call for women to be more involved. And I remember um, Birgitta saying to me when she was still in politics that there were so few women who showed showed the a uh, finance uh, committee of the uh, in parliament any interest <laughs> and that's why she wanted to be there to have a, a different voice uh, so and there's a call for for more women in in in, in economic uh, in business and economics all over the world you know one report and and paper after another showing that having female voices in there actually does make a difference yeah, exactly. And I think, uh, like, I noticed that, uh, like, when I was doing international work, and, and you know, um, I have never been a big fan of NATO, for example, but I thought it would be very interesting to understand the, you know, how it works, because I cannot suggest any change to anything unless I understand how it works in the first place, like, uh, you know, Vala was, uh, you know, talking about the 36. If she didn't know about it, she couldn't come up with a more clever solution to dismantle it. And so I noticed that in NATO, like in all these sort of parliamentary things, you have a, sort of a, a mirror of how parliaments are supposed to work, like in the international work. And in NATO, you had all these different committees. You had the humanitarian committees, and then you had the economic committee, and you had, uh, you know, uh, hybrid war committees or whatnot, and all the women uh, went into the humanitarian stuff, whereas like I was the only one sitting and listening into the economy, uh, e e economy committee because I felt, and I was the only woman often. It was unbelievable because women had been told that it's too complex for us. It's a man's domain, which is kind of crazy. But 
uh, hopefully that you know that is going to change and the same applies with if you want to to change um and fight for uh the climate and earth why in the world would you select to be in the um environmental committee you should go into the industry committee because that's where you get the changes needed and so we have to re program ourselves and get people inside these different spaces that have never been occupied with people that think like us. Yes, are you ready for more questions? Here's one from Kanan. All these ideas are of course very promising. When people try to implement them, they come across many real world hurdles. Unsurprisingly, how can we create a forum where such pioneers can come together and figure out how to tackle those hurdles by learning from each other and brainstorming? Well, this is one forum, um, but we need these discussions to be uh, happening everywhere. Um, and this is what I discuss with my students every year. Then they go out and, and do their own thing. You, we just need to replicate what we have learned um, and hold, uh, hold discussions with, with our friends and families. You know, um, Two years ago, I decided that I needed to have uh, uh, discussions in my living room, sort of like the salons were on in the enlightenment period. And I, I invited whoever, on Facebook, anybody who was interested to come and, 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 and discuss. And they, came, they drove all the way to Morsville Spy, which is like 17 kilometers outside of Reykjavik, to have these discussions. And, and they actually continued until COVID. Then it wasn't really possible for us to meet. But I'm, I'm, I aim now that I live in the center of Reykjavik to continue this. Um, and we read, you know, several books together and, 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 you know, bounced, you know, ideas back and forth. We need a lot of those. So if you're in a book club, you know, find, find a good book to, to read, not only a novel, you know, find, read Naomi Klein or, or, you know, uh, Eisenstein or, or whoever is actually, you know, writing about change. Mm, Anyone would, want to add to that? Yeah. Oh yes, uh, I would like to uh, add. Uh, basically, I feel like again, it just reminds me of uh, like what I mentioned a little bit is also that uh, the, the the conversation, the intellect, uh, the informing, uh, the blueprints are necessary. But then, what often I feel also lacks is the practice. And so, like, for example, I mentioned, like, uh, a community center in Iceland or wherever in the world, and uh, you have basically this, you have this environment of whatever people coming in to meet others, uh, dancing or uh, doing yoga or whatever martial arts. Uh, what's really important is also that the, what, what is this community based off of on what kind of values? Um, and especially if you want to make this an open community center that other people can get into, uh, what you're trying to do is, is that I think uh, in order to get to this promising level is again, it's just the more of the inclusion and trying to basically practice these values rather than just uh, talking about them all the time. And I think through that, uh, through these actions, I think uh, some of these things that we're talking about are going to seem a lot more realistic. Um, to share an experience actually, and I think it still relates to the question is like uh, when I was living in Sweden last year and I was uh, meeting actually with a community center by the name of Noden, which was founded by people that had been involved with the Burning Man community. And uh, they had basically made, I'd never been really much involved with Burning Man or knew much about them, but it was very fascinating to uh, see what they basically, even though they don't really have, uh, at least from what I've learned, too much of a direction, like they're not trying to really spread uh, an idea or try to get somewhere like a, a appeasing politics or whatever, but uh, they do live a lifestyle, um, a lot of them, where they meet in this community and they really put, they really put to practice and things I've tried to kind of smear and remind the Zeitgeist movement, things like leave no trace behind or basically uh, learning, you know, to 
you know, not to, to find the, the commonalities more than the differences and whatnot. And I think the more that we as a society do that, and I think Reykjavik or Iceland has uh, one of the biggest chances of doing this, maybe Faroese Islands, if you want to get competitive <laughs> in, a, in a humorous sense. But I think this is really, really possible. And we're very close to, uh, to doing this, to actually making it look more hopeful and a lot more realistic rather than things coming out of uh, talks or lectures on uh, how we can uh, basically sustain better well-being. Can I add... Uh... Uh, one comment, because I think that Cliff is uh, correct as regards the importance of uh, social experiments. Voluntary communities uh, uh, have been, uh, I guess, uh, as old, uh, at least as Christianity when it comes to Europe. Mm, the first monasteries were uh, an example of uh, uh, voluntary communities. And in fact, they also practiced early forms of communism, if you like. Um, I think also that the carbon footprint was pretty low. And uh, um, you need examples that people can uh, witness and think about, and you need uh, uh, ideas uh, that uh, uh, lead uh, people into having uh, life-changing insights. And uh, you need them uh, all the time, everywhere and endlessly. We will never have one forum that reaches everyone. We will never have one example that will convince everyone. Uh, the Soviet Union didn't work in that respect, for example, or the Paris Commune either, you know, we've had, uh, or the Christian monasteries, to go back to my early example. So um, as uh, I think uh, the lifelong commitment of uh, at least three uh, speakers uh, here to politics and activism uh, exemplifies, uh, we just have to reach as many fora as possible, to um, promote as many social experiments as possible, and try to convince and change the lives of as many people as possible. If enough millions of people do it on earth, then there will be hope. Yes, exactly. Uh, I was just thinking about uh little drops of water. So, you know, one little tiny drop might not change a lot, but when the real shift is when we inspire by our actions, uh, others uh, to try out and, and, and it's okay if we do some experimentation and if it doesn't work, it doesn't mean that you have to give up. Uh, I don't know how many mistakes I've made, and it's not mistakes because I have chosen to learn from it. Um, you know, I've tried so many different things. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, but I know that nothing is as important as, you know, taking ownership and responsibility for how we feel and how we relate to others. We are nothing without the relationship with other peoples. And so if we preach some kindness and shift to others and do not implement it ourselves in our own lives, then it's never going to work. But we can always change. It's okay. We can always change what we're trying and see if it doesn't feel right. You know, like uh, Giorgio said, there is not, not one way. There are many ways. That's the beauty of it. There's another question here for Cliff, I think. A lot of great resources being mentioned here. Can a one page of links be shared with everyone, please? So I'm assuming that's uh, referring to Koto. And uh, yes, of course. Um, I, they sh will be shared uh, also on the Zeitgeist Movement Icelands and also the TZM Global page. Um, all, all contact information as well, how to get a hold of all of us and as well as Koto. Uh, for the new thing, <laughs> it's still um, it's still in the groundworks and ideas and trying to meet with people to make it work. So you'll have to just keep, uh, you'll just have to keep, keep an eye or keep, um, uh, how do you say again, just, uh, I don't know, just keep on the lookout for it basically, uh, for when uh, we have something a little more established. It's uh, 
yeah, but Koto would be the one I think to pay attention to the most because they are over there in Finland uh, on the on the rise of actually making something happen. So I highly recommend looking at their YouTube channel, their website, and that will all be listed a little bit later after the uh, meeting has passed. Can I ask you something, Cliff? Yeah. Because, you know, in, in my sustainable futures class, and I discuss these intentional communities with my students and you know and they are they are many and and based on you know different principles but how is koto different for, from for example the eco village movement which is 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 actually quite a lot of um, communities around the world based on their um, training and and ideas to give you an honest answer, of course, is that I do not know much about them, uh, to be honest. Um, okay. I, can only, I can only say this, that uh, I don't know what can be so much different except for what I've noticed in my personal experience when I've visited communities uh, and whatnot. And I've also in my, whatever, in, in my life, I've seen quite a few and that one of the commonality problems that they had is again, that it just went into, uh, looking into again just lots of things like infighting not being able to take care of the social environments and uh things getting a little bit too toxic especially when it's a very small group of people that get very intimate after a while and that's also a a cause of being too isolated uh spending less time with people outside of the group rather than so and i think yeah, I, I, what's i've up? actually attended a global eco village network meeting mm -hmm. um, where I discuss these issues, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and they actually have have a formulated methodologies to to solve conflicts, but they do actually say, um, or one of them said to me, actually one of the most um, tiring part of being a member of my eco village. I think he was in Austria is all the endless meetings where we have to find a compromise <laughs> and and make a decision so and I so it is it is possible but it takes time yeah and i i think that's the point is that uh with people in koto um over in finland uh they're being very realistic about it i think and i mean basically there's no big expectations that koto within uh its first a few months or a year is going to be extremely successful, but it's going to need definitely a lot of feedback from them or maybe from one of these other eco cities or communities that I mean, yeah, communities that you are mentioning and that for people uh, from Koto and Finland right now listening, uh, I hope they're taking input on this because that's the point is uh, maybe also there's an advantage of this that uh, Koto might not know uh, about these other organizations because uh, if they try and do something first and seeing where structure is basically not working in the environment and then they look towards the others, uh, that might be a good idea to exchange information, for example, on how, uh, how to improve uh, maybe on both ends. So that basically, yeah, it's, the, it's also in the end, the elect it's also the environment of being able to produce uh, again some kind of an uh, some kind of an output as a service for others outside of Koto but as well as they want to really expand as well and use the technology at bay and not necessarily strive as far maybe um, at, at, at short at short term like maybe the Venus project might uh, want to try and do but uh, just try to really yeah you know, make it uh, definitely that uh, that technology definitely, is able to be of uh, a great functionality in this. So that would perhaps, as Mike just said, would be the difference. I have a question for Birgitta. Birgitta, do you think Julian is now controlled by the CIA as a pawn, as some skeptics say? Question by Pro Solis. No, uh, absolutely not. Um, and yeah. Just no, I've never, I mean, I've heard so many different theories. He's controlled by Russia, CIA, blah, blah, blah. He's just controlled by himself. You know, he's a very egotistical person. So <laughs> I don't think he's uh, controlled by any clandestine organization. 
And then we have here to the speakers, especially Clifford. What do you all think about permaculture? Can you speak on that? From Al Kurt. I, I can do that. Uh, yeah, you go first, Vala. Uh, I've taken, I, I have a, a permaculture uh, design certificate from a course I took in Norway because I was interested to learn about it. I had heard about it for many years, but had the opportunity to attend the course and then brought the, the same teacher to Iceland to teach. I think permaculture is great because it's based on ecological principles. Uh, it's all about to use uh, uh, and learn from the local ecosystems and conserve water and conserve energy and, and grow as much as you can in your own balcony or, or back garden and um, um, et cetera. And, and, and what I particularly like about the permaculture movement, which actually comes from Australia, is it, that it has three basic values. It is care for, care for nature, care for people, and share the proceeds or share the profits. What could be better, you know? If we all lived according to that, we wouldn't be in the trouble we have now. Yeah, and I can also by jump in and say that definitely this is of interest uh, to people working in Koto. Uh, and I also have an interest in it. I don't have the background or certificate as Vala does, but uh, I definitely uh, see it as something that should be applied and looked into a lot more. So there are yeah. permaculture teachers in Finland. So, you know, it should be easy for the people in Finland to to attend. Yeah, like that's 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 the thing is that I don't know. Uh, I'm also I'm involved with uh, my my in, my involvement. Just so everyone knows that uh, with uh, Colt has been limited because I mean I've been uh, just in uh, just included in chats. I mean I I know the people from uh, you know there are also people involved in the zeitgeist movement. So I've I've met them. I know them personally. Um, and I've been, that was another reason why I wanted to get involved with Koto because I thought this is cool. Uh, but every, that they also, there's, there's many types of chats and there's different uh, things concentrated in how to make Koto possible. It's not just one feed. So there are perhaps co uh, uh, conversations about uh, premature culture or whatnot that's uh, happened that I do not know about. So again, um, I encourage again, everyone looking into the links that I will post later and also asking them and uh, engaging in discussion. And I'm sure it will be very much uh, appreciated. And on my behalf, if you wanna talk about it with me another time. Uh, here's a question from Justin Megatron. Uh, will the UBI be a possible transition over to the Venus project or another better studied societal structure? I'll, uh, I'll jump in for that. Um, I, I don't, uh, I'm not a spokesperson for the Venus project, but I feel like that, so that's kind of, uh, at least from other people that I know from the Venus project, that that's kind of a, a split answer. Um, I mean, we're not necessarily like in, in the Zeitgeist movement, uh, people were actually firstly promoting the works of Jacques Fresco and the Venus project in the early days, and some still do and some don't. And then there are people that again, they're very split on the subject where a UBI or a universal basic income is really a stepping stone towards a, uh, uh, to getting to what they would call a resource-based economy or, uh, or otherwise uh, post-scarcity uh, society, if you want to put our economy. So it, it's a little bit split, uh, I think, um, how to get there. And I think somebody from the Venus Project should really answer it. But I mean, anyone here that is familiar with Jacques Fresco. I don't know what um, uh, where they make their minds on that to make it possible. Uh, can I my stuff in here? So you, I, I've looked a little bit into the university, uh, universal basic income aspect of, of a new economy. And actually what it looks to me is that the experiments that have been done, they have, they're all positive. And they, they range from being done in, in Finland in the UK, um, in Canada, all over Africa, etc. And 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 basically, uh, you know, one there was one article in the British in one of the British newspapers. I can't remember which one, where, where or maybe it was even in the Economist that said, 
the um, that the reason why you know that the best way to hand money to the poor poor is to actually give it to them. <laughs> and 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 that was after they did an experiment with I think 14 homeless people in one of the cities of the UK. Uh, after a year, nine of them actually had found found uh, a, a place to live. They had, none of them had spent all the money that they were given, and they didn't spend it all on drugs and alcohol. They, they spent all the money on bettering themselves. Um, there, is, there is an experiment from the 80s of, in uh, Canada where one village, you know, raised everybody's uh, income, which was like 30% of the people in that village were under the poverty limits. They raised everybody incomes to the po poverty limits. And then this data was not analyzed until 30 years later. And actually the outcome was not only better for the people who received this and the families who received it, but also the next generation, you know, kids stayed longer in school, uh, girls had, had uh, children later, they, those who had children, they spent some time home with them, um, they, had, yeah, they had better education, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think it should. I think it is a, a, a one step into having a regenerative economy, but it's not the only step. I, I think that in regard to this, uh, I think actually the study on the homeless people was uh, in Canada as well, and they selected specifically people that were not dealing with uh, severe mental illness and uh, drug addiction. That may be another study. This one was definitely, I'm referring to, was in the UK. Okay, okay, because it is certainly BBC last week, uh, an episode. <laughs> anyway, um, in regard to the reason why I am interested in universal basic income is not necessarily a, because of... Um, stepping stone into uh, a different economic model. The reason why I just think it's so important is because I have seen so many people fall between the cracks in the welfare, in the welfare system, you know, or people that want to get education, they can't get education because they haven't finished Danish or something. So they can't get further education. Uh, people that need uh, support, um, because they get sick or and so forth are not getting the support so there are so many cracks uh, and the system seems to be created to make people um, you know feel like they are less than human it's uh, it's like a system of uh, the sort of like you know um, it's like a system of dehumanization and there are so many people that are experiencing this and it's so expensive to run the system uh, in order to get like a minimum payment. And you're punished if you get a little bit of work. You know, you're punished and you are like put into, um, you know, a situation where you're stuck. Generation after generation, you're stuck in a po poverty trap instead of, you know, we foster the ability for people to just, you know, thrive and, uh, you know, uh, follow the flow of life, <laughs> you know. And so if we could just eliminate the unemployment office, the disability office, the uh, pension office, and just have a flat, uh, you know, no strings attached to begin with, with these uh, groups of people. We're having so many people unemployed because of COVID. We should immediately eliminate all these offices that are sort of like trying to figure out a way to shave off uh, some, you know, uh, sets from people that are already having below poverty payments. So that's why I like uh, uh, basic income. May, may I add uh, uh, some uh, thoughts in regard to universal basic income, which I think can uh, solve many issues with the welfare provision, as Birgitta is saying. Uh, I have uh, relatives uh, living in the United Kingdom, in Scotland uh, specifically, and uh, um, well, some of them have gone through all kinds of uh, ritual institutional humiliations 
in order to be able to claim uh, the resources that they need in order to survive. So we're talking about life goods, <laughs> uh, a la McMartry. Um, the UBI has an interesting history because it's an idea that uh, in the current form originates from uh, the right of the political spectrum rather than the left. Richard Nixon proposed it, for example, in the United States in the 1960s. Although the most successful experiments were performed by uh, left-wing governments, and I'm thinking of Mincom in Canada in the 1970s, and uh, the Bolsa Familia under Lula in uh, Brazil. Uh, so it has uh, uh, the potential to bring growth where growth is needed in uh, terms of actual life enablement, because growth is not necessarily bad. Uh, by using uh, an apt value theory, there can be good growth and bad growth. Bad growth is growth where we don't need it anymore, and where it just destroys and consumes human beings, their free time, their mental well-being, and their environment. But there is also good growth where it means finally getting rid of utter poverty, ignorance, and the inability to access those institutions and opportunities that allow for uh, personal well-being and self-realization, such as higher education, for instance. If I may just add something in just really quickly if, if before we move on is that I also think, yeah, just that universal basic income, um, I also don't really see it as kind of necessarily a, a stepping stone towards uh, what we might want to call a uh, monetary list or post-scarcity economy or whatnot. But in my personal view, I think what I think a universal basic income might also help enable is uh, just as kind of just mentioned is that it will also perhaps help people come to another conclusion that uh, not necessarily directly and it would be something that perhaps would take time. I think that UBI though will eventually lead to uh, the access of basic necessity becoming a bigger understanding. So if uh, you're basically being, you're getting coverage uh, to, uh, you have un an unconditional right to have a house uh, or to have water or to have food. I think uh, this kind of stuff, which I've heard talked about, so universal basic necessity, if I don't, if I remember correctly, I heard it in a university in Austria uh, being spoke about for the first time years ago, but I feel like that UBI can slowly grow into that, that people are no longer just dependent off of, um, even just from a basic income, but that some things will eventually just become a human right to uh, people. And I feel like this could be, this would also be something leading into uh, a much greater connection and in way into a uh, post-scarcity economy, I think. Cliff, uh, may, may I mention the fact that having a roof over your head, not one that you own necessarily, but one that protects you from the elements, having enough food, having enough water, having primary education, and uh, having healthcare when ill, however provided that may be, are already human rights. Yeah. And it's, it's the international covenant on uh, economic, social, and cultural rights that is as old as 1966 in uh, uh, its uh, passing at the uh, United Nations and then at the uh, came into entry in the 1970s. I can't recall the exact year, but it was in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are already human rights. They are not a charity that the state uh, provides and that can be withhold at will. These are rights of the individual, at least uh, in all those countries that have signed and ratified the covenant. Yeah, and then when, and, and I understand that. And again, it just makes me think just how contradicting uh, this entire, uh, uh, dominance uh, level of society that we're all in basically that it's not that these human rights are not being uh, uh, they are they are not uh, being uh, Im implemented or recognized basically mm -hmm. so that's what I hope is that maybe UEI might help people come closer to having a better understanding of them 
Yes, ready for the next one? Uh, Justin Megatron or also asks, how and why do the people in go governmental positions avoid on a ground level criminal activities as in they can decide to send people to war to push the war machine as and when they please? My personal views are in line with Jack Fresco. Anyone else here also familiar with Jack Fresco, the founder and architect of the Venus Project? Uh, passed a, a few. He passed away a few years ago at 101. Yeah, no, yeah I, I know his work. I can't say very much about him. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd be, but the war machine is actually, you know, ruling things behind the scenes, you know, um, and and that comes becomes very visible when uh, nations like the United States go regularly into into all sorts of war, unnecessary wars, and like in the Balkans and and in in the Far East because they need to use up the weapons so that the weapons factories can continue working. This, mm -hmm. however, is, is not um, very, very visible. Um, and, but this is something that we really need to discuss. If, uh, compare, for example, how much, how much money, I, I, I wrote this in some paper a few years ago, I compared how much money was supposed to go into the Green uh, Sustainability Fund for the, uh, the sustainable development goals to the international war budget, and it was much lower. So we have the money. It's just not being spent in the right places. Money so, has never been a problem <laughs> insofar <laughs> as states can uh, create it at will. Now, under the present conditions, even private banks can create it at will. Uh, so it's the control over money that is uh, of crucial importance. And that leads back into uh, part of what Cliff was saying uh, regarding the financial side of uh, uh, grassroots movements. And uh, Einar in particular in his uh, utopia of uh, moneyless uh, reality, perhaps we don't need to do away with money, but with the origin of money, rather than being some higher authority that imposes it onto people, it can be a grassroots creation. Uh, there are uh, such uh, social experiments going on online these days. It's not just Bitcoin, there is Equacoin, for example, uh, going on, whereby uh, the participants uh, decide which projects uh, to fund in a democratic way and each participant receives a kind of uh, basic income that can be spent on the uh, economic activities that orbit around uh, this virtual coin. So um, that is perhaps one way uh, to uh, redistribute uh, economic power. Hmm. It's like what we were talking about uh, the other day when uh, we were chatting uh, that, you know, that a dead tree is worth more than a living tree. And I think that applies on all fields and what this system has to say to all living beings, including us uh, people. So therefore, that's kind of my opinion about it in, in general. Mm -hmm. We have a continuing question about the UPA. Uh, from Colin Turner. UPI is a perfect way to maintain the current system. Of course, UPI will have positive effects in a monetary economy. Why wouldn't it? The question ought to be how it solves consumerism, ecocide, and an endless growth economy. I felt like that we kind of uh, touched upon uh, some of that stuff uh, earlier when asked the question. Um, I still, like I said, I think my point still resides that uh, there are both drawbacks and there are benefits, uh, of course, to it. Um, I feel like uh, I think it was Vala that mentioned just like uh, when they did the 
UBI. Well, it's in it's in Finland, I believe. Um, I mean, yes, that's I'm very sure that's where it's going on. And just looking into the very uh, that people were not like using it to booze out or whatever or go on spending sprees or whatever. But people, a lot of people, are actually taking advantage of sustaining themselves. And uh, that doesn't always mean uh, consumerism, I think, in the end, if that answers part of uh, the concern or the question. The universal facial income experiments that have been done before have never paid out enough money so that people actually um, can go on spending sprees. It actually b provides the basic needs or helps mm -hmm. provide the basic needs uh, to give people some dignity. I think that is the, the main aim. Exactly, and I, 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 I feel like that that's exactly where it's going for because it just, it does, it's, you're not getting a big sum of money or whatnot. Uh, you're getting yourself to uh, basically uh, put, uh, take the stress or the weight off your shoulders off so you can basically function again if you're in a, a very difficult situation, of course, financially. So uh, it's a reliever in a sense. Um, I'm not, I, I can't say exactly just as Vala just pointed that it's not enough to uh, really make you go and uh, just be a wild consum a con consumer again. Although I'm not denying that also uh, people perhaps would try and take advantage of it, but I think they won't be able to sustain it. If, if I may add to the consumer part of it, because we haven't really discussed much. Uh, is the fact that um, you know I've I've been living in the last uh, maybe a year below poverty, uh, and uh, been really enjoying not buying anything except food and maybe a light bulb or something, and um, it's and I've never been much of like just buying stuff for the sake of buying stuff, but honestly it doesn't really matter how much money you make you will always find ways to spend it. You know what I mean? You never have enough. And so um, I think the biggest shift we could do to protect the environment is uh, that each and every one plots to stop being a fucking stupid tourist uh, in like a low cost fast food tourist industry. And secondly, stop buying um, uh, batteries that you cannot recharge. Demand that shops actually will sell you rechargeable batteries. There is like no supermarket in Iceland where I can buy rechargeable batteries. But, uh, you know, at the counter, I can go and buy uh, batteries that are going to end up in a landfill, most likely. Not everyone recycles. So demand that you can buy military-grade printers, military-grade cars, refrigerators, phones, that are not going to break down after five years mm -hmm. uh, and stop by all means taking responsibility for the petroleum industry for plastics for example the responsibility is not on us as individuals it's on these corporations that have been abusing this planet for so long uh, and we buying their crap you can't even recycle most of this plastic it's just going to be burnt in sweden or in a landfill somewhere so you know don't, don't buy their bullshit. Tell Shell to, you know, go app themselves. May I uh, add a point? Because I think that Birgitta was uh, uh, spot on uh, with regard to what people can do as consumers. And that is one of uh, our uh, economic uh, uh, faces. We have several faces. We are uh, consumers, we are producers, we are investors. Uh, if you have uh, any disposable capital that uh, you can put into a bank or into a pension fund or whatever. Uh, and so there are ways in all these economic functions that we each individually uh, uh, perform that can help us steer the ship in the right direction. But then we are not just economic agents, we are political agents. So we can vote for certain parties. We can uh, put pressure on our MPs and representatives. We can participate in uh, uh, the, the 
political life of our community and uh, uh, enroll in a political party. There are trade unions, there are NGOs. So there are many things that we can do and we have to do them all. <laughs> uh, and so do uh, more and more people whom we can convince through our social experiments or our inspiring uh, talks and fora. Uh, it is also very important, I think, to add the responsibility of the supply side, not just the demand side, because here we've been focusing on demand, starting with the UBI and so on. There must be strict rules and regulations that are forcibly applied, stopping uh, industries and um, also financial corporations from uh, uh, facilitating life destructive uh, practices such as, for example, the arms industry. If a country made it impossible, very difficult for its banks to invest money into uh, the military sector, that would help. This is something, for example, that has been discussed repeatedly by, uh, well, the heads of the Catholic Church since the, uh, Benedict XV, during the First World War. So it's all the ideas that you know need a refresh and need uh, pushed forward with every generation. I was thinking while we were all discussing how many of the things we have said about uh, uh, well-being not being measurable in terms of GDP, um, advertising, making us stupid and making us buy a lot of crap, as Birgitta rightly calls it. Um, and the war machine as guiding political decision-making in the United States of America. All these things can be found in the work of John Kenneth Galbraith, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century. In fact, it ended in 2004, but he is not taught in our universities like Schumacher is not taught, of small is beautiful, and Vala is a member of the uh, Schumacher Institute. Because uh, uh, instead uh, at university, we have neoliberal textbooks and only neoliberal conceptions that are being peddled to students. So yeah, uh, we have brought together so many levels and with each level, we have, uh, also envisioned ways, tools, instruments that can be used in order to improve things, which makes me very hopeful. Yeah, but the thing is that we have all the solutions. Mm -hmm. We just need to get together and, and demand that they are implemented and, and take part in showing that we are actually are role models in, in changing our lives. Um, yeah, we don't need more technology. We don't need more, we don't need to go to Mars, you know, although a, a lot of technology is developed in, you know, going to other, pl other planets, but we, we actually just need to gather together all the knowledge we have and, and, and just, let's just do it, you know? <laughs> So we have a one final question. It's from Adam Antium. How do you maintain your optimism considering the large task of social transformation? And this is for everyone. Well, this is a question my students often ask me. And, uh, and, and basically when I woke up to the unsustainability of the world, which is now about 20 years ago, I decided that I needed to shift everything I was doing to try to find some solutions. And, 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 and basically I was, you know, I'm a, actually a geologist and was working on environmental science and environmental scientists work on problems. But sustainability scientists that I sort of turned into solutions. So we just need to find the solutions and there is not one solution for, 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 for all. 
and implement them uh, where we are. And I feel I, 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 I need to do this in order to be able to uh, have a conversation with my grandchildren. Because I don't want them to say, Amma, which is grandmother in Icelandic, why didn't you, you do anything? You are a sustainability scientist. And, I, and I, I do at least want to say, I really tried. Because otherwise, I, I would just do uh, what the, you know, the average Icelanders does when they, they don't want to confront the problems. You just go out and get drunk. I would be drunk all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can drop a, two pennies here because uh, the reason why I keep being optimistic is that I'm a student of history. And I look back, I see horrible cruelties uh, that have been uh, slowly uh, reduced or eliminated. We have made enormous progress uh, as a species in a relatively short time. And uh, that says something about uh, our uh, collective abilities for uh, self-correction. Uh, it, it is always a, an uphill uh, struggle. But I mean, think for example of uh, uh, the abolition of slavery and the abolition of uh, aristocratic privilege. They have been with us uh, for uh, uh, countless centuries. Uh, they were taken by many as uh, just a fact of life, like having air to breathe or, or trees, well, with the exception of certain parts of Iceland and Greenland, of course. <laughs> but, uh, well, we managed to produce the ideas, the values, the institutions, and the momentum required to uh, get past them. So we can do it. It won't happen from one day to the next, perhaps we won't even notice when it happens. If I can jump in and just say what uh, gives me optimism to keep on going. Uh, it's like what I was speaking actually with Wallace's uh, friend with the philosopher the other evening, who was a really splendid person to speak with. And he was kind of challenging, I think, this notion on uh, the optimism and it also reminds me a little bit of even like what Birgit has shared in her speech. And just basically it's, it's, you know, if this is in when I'm coming back to like how I feel and say is like, if this is what you really want, this is what you want to see for yourself as much importantly, also for other people, your environments, because you're nothing without the relationships. Uh, you know, you're not, you're nothing without those relationships with other people. If you want all this, what do you have to lose? Really? I mean, this is, this is your life, it's our life. And if you have the intention to really make uh, good well-being for people, and I think people uh, take it very for granted, um, you know, how far people's passions and wanting can actually bring them, especially. I'm a real strong uh, knowledger and believer in that. Uh, you know, and just a lot of people have inspired me from the zeitgeist movement and also from other places, uh, even a few political people, uh, whatever their beliefs, or whatever, they basically also have, they're also people and they share things that are motivating that uh, I see uh, a lot of truth in more or less. But one thing I'll just close in by saying that um, it actually has to be uh, for, uh, for Icelanders and that um, basically for, for a country of such a size, so small, uh, yet when something happens in relationship to uh, the environment or politicians uh, misbehaving and, uh, you know, corruption being exposed or whatever, the voice that the Icelanders make sends volume shockwaves across uh, the whole entire globe and, uh, and standing in defiance or uh, pointing out to stuff. And, you know, I remember when I was young, seven, uh, 17 or so, before I could even, yeah, I had a beard and I saw uh, Birgit de Jong's daughter with so many people uh, uh, challenging <laughs> the corruption in the government. Uh, back then I was too intimidated to even try and pronounce her name. Uh, it's changed now. I never even expected that 13 years later I, I would be living here in Iceland and know her and a lot of other people that were in this personally. 
and that's uh, they've been a huge, huge uh, inspiration for me uh, all of these years since I started uh, thinking a little bit outside the box and re-questioning uh, community and all this stuff. So that's my personal answer again, aside from the Zeitgeist movement, is that a lot of people here in Iceland are what keep me here going. So I'm happy to be here and that they could come and speak their minds and voices to share with the Zeitgeist movement and for the whole world, basically. Einar, why don't you say something? I can say something. Well, I'm not optimistic at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's clear, but I I feel it as my duty to 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 keep on trying with all those good people that I met during the last few decades working on this, and I owe it to my children and 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 their children and and other people around me to to do my best because I I see a problem and I know about solutions, and and yeah I have to keep working on it. It's it's just my duty. I, I could just check out and, and give up, but but uh, I couldn't actually live with it. So this is, my, this is my duty, this is my destiny to do this. But I don't agree completely with Giorgio that we uh, got rid of, of aristocracy and, and, and slavery. I just think we changed the, the methods of becoming an aristocrat and a slave. I think we are more or less all slaves of, of, the, of the monetary system. But I think that we, we can find that solution, and as Vala said, we have to find the solution, otherwise, otherwise we're just doomed. So, but not, don't let me <laughs> reduce your optimism. So, uh, <laughs> I, I think we, I think we will manage somehow, sometime. So, Brigitte. Well, you know, me and Einar, we have known each other for a very long time, <laughs> and um, you know, Einar was one of the people that inspired me. And so, um, you know, I think the, the uh, machine that drives my occasional uh, unbearable lightness of being is the to be inspired by other people. And my greatest gift is when I hear that other people have been inspired by me. Uh, and so for me, that's enough energy to just go on uh, and uh, to meet like-minded people and knowing that we are just doing our best. You know, as long as we have good intentions, we're not uh, trampling on other people's rights, uh, except we might have to do that when it comes to the 0.001% that owns everything. Uh, like, you know, <laughs> the new ar aristocracy is Bezos and, and those guys. So um, yeah, just never give up. Never, ever give up my only advice you know but we're not always going to be like i'm so optimistic i'm actually <laughs> a really pessimistic to be honest but uh, <laughs> i'm worse than Aina. i just hide it better <laughs> so yeah thanks everyone it was great very inspirational you're all great <laughs> yes i'm very happy i took part in this discussion thank you Right. Adios. Bless. Yeah, we'll see you. Oh, oh, wait, uh, uh, is, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, you close the meeting then? Yes, let's do that. So we would like to express a huge thanks to all of our speakers and to everyone watching the live stream for participating in a 12th Global Sea Day. Despite the challenges through a pandemic, we did it. We hope that everyone can take something back from this conference to heart with an expanded sense of understanding and possibility for the world. And we hope we have uh, had the new renewed energy of collaborations to shift the tides for positive change. Our true power lies in our relationships to each other and our ability to work towards common, towards common ends through a common desire for change. The sooner we realize this, the sooner we can overcome the world problems we face to obsolete the old and advance the new. We are not victims of a collapsing world. We are participants, we are architects. While the conference portion of our event has concluded, we now move to our live themed after party. Volume will be hosting this year's Global Sea Days after party in their studio in Reykjavik. 
There will be three DJ sets with each DJ playing one hour each. Our DJs this year will be Carla Rosemary playing Minimal House and Deep House, Eivindur Eggertsson playing Deep House and Tech House, and the rock grandmother Andrea Jónsdóttir playing Icelandic and International Rock and Alternative. There will also be interviews with our artists after each of their performances. This after party live stream will be moved over to TCM's Iceland's Facebook page. For a direct link, please visit www.sidegastmovement.is. We hope you all enjoy the show. We also have a few important announcements to make concerning TCM before continuing out to the after party. As of today, we would like to initiate a new milestone for the movement, which has become known among many as TCM 2.0. For over 10 years, TCM's role has been to bring awareness of possibilities and introduce a train of thought for realizing progress and sustainability in the world. Over that time, we helped spread some key understandings, the flaws and contradictions of the current system, the 1% injustice, the urgencies of ecological crisis, the trends and implications of technology unemployment, political mechanism like a universal basic income, structural systematic awareness and fostering exploration beyond the labor for income system. Humanity's collective consciousness is emergent. Our circumstances constantly ch change as a movement we must also emerge and adapt and be willing to meet reality and existing systems where they are at. Our rate of social progress is bound to the level of understanding of the great majority. And while awareness building is still a core focus at TCM, we have broadened our context and approaches to include all necessary and emergent avenues for this transition. These approaches include intentional communities, co-ops, use share libraries, political legal mechanisms, public banking and collaborative design platforms, culture and music activities to name a few. Where before our large scale system change goals may have lacked practical application to the, into the everyday here and now, and where community projects may have fall, failed in their ability to address more mechanisms of society, there can be much more of a bridge between the two. This will allow participants and ideas to flourish more fluidly and or organically. Affecting progress where we can while always maintaining and working towards the bigger picture implications for a radical paradigm shift of the unsustainable systems in place. In future communication, we'll be exploring these approaches in detail and we'll also cover some of the wisdom and lessons learned in the experience of the movement, how our chapter organizational structure has evolved and became much more fluid and decentralized as well as expand on some of the core concepts of the train of thought. Also, TCM has updated itself with a new code of conduct for involvement to ensure a more productive and friendly environment for activism. The guidelines inform everyone about the standard of behavior expected within the community and will facilitate newcomers to feel more welcomed in to get involved. The code of conduct can be found at www.thesidegeistmovement.com. There is also a new website that has been designed to be an interactive resource and information hub for activists. This includes receiving and distributing, distributing information about current activity and projects happening, including graphics, templates and documents as tools for building our content and furthering these ideas. 
The website can also be used to give status and progress reports for your region's activity and also request assistance if needed. The website URL is simply TCM community, tcm.community. For anyone that would like to gather and talk about this new TCM 2.0 states and what you think that should mean, as well as discussing your thoughts on this year's Global Sea Day event, you're welcome to join TCM's Discord server at 11 UTC, Iceland time tomorrow on Sunday, for an open meeting. Directions for accessing the Discord server, as well as finding links to our official social media platforms, can be found on, at our main website www.thesidegeistmovement.com. And so, to conclude, we wish you and everyone else in the world to stay healthy for the rest of 2020. And we will see you all again next year in 2021 in Mongolia for our 13th annual Sea Day Global Main event. Sjáumst. Sjáumst. Takk fyrir. Thank you. Bye.